Good afternoon and welcome to this British Academy event. My name is Dorothy Bishop and I'm Professor of Developmental Neuropsychology at the University of Oxford and also Chair of the Psychology section of the British Academy. Today's event forms part of our new series, Leaders in Shape, where we meet the most influential figures within and beyond academia who are shaping the fields of social science, humanities and the arts. The first event in the series, which took place last month, featured Gary Young. And today it gives me great pleasure to welcome Claudia Hammond to our virtual stage for episode two. Claudia is an author, broadcaster and visiting professor of the public understanding of psychology at the University of Sussex. Her latest book, The Art of Rest, How to Find Respite in the Modern Age, was released last year. And she's well known to psychologists as the presenter of the Radio 4 series, All in the Mind, which does a fantastic job of presenting psychological topics to a broad audience. I was delighted when she was awarded the British Academy's President's Medal in 2017 for outstanding service to the cause of the humanities and social sciences. Today, we're going to discuss Claudia's life and career for about 30 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please submit this in the YouTube chat section. And you're welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in the Academy's Twitter handle, the British Academy. Um, and just otherwise sit back and enjoy our 30 minutes of discussion. Hello, Claudia. Welcome and thank you for joining us. To start Hi, well, thank you so much. Great to be invited. <laughs> yep, it's great to see you again. To start our discussion, I wanted to look back to your childhood. I read that you announced your interest to work in radio to Roald Dahl when you asked for his autograph at a children's book festival. So what sparked your love of radio? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, according to my parents, I was about 10 or 11 at the time, and um, they didn't know that I was, you know, interested in radio or TV or media, and that Roald Dahl, I queued up to get his autograph, obviously, loving his books, and then he asked, uh, you know, what I was going, what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I told him I wanted to work in, in radio. And uh, so I don't know, really. I mean, radio had always been on in the background and obviously I'd always, you know, watched TV as a child and uh, and realised there must be people, you know, behind the scenes uh, who were making all of this happen and that this would be it's always on all sorts of different topics and that this would be something really interesting to do. And at that time, I know that there was a lot of people now say they want to go into the media. At that time, it was more unusual. And I can remember uh, when I was a bit older at school, them asking asking us me you know what I'd like to do and I uh, and had a look there was a sort of card index box where you could look up different jobs and I looked under radio and there was nothing and then I looked under T for television um, and it had television aerial erector but you know I'm not too good at climbing on rooftops so I'm not sure I'd have been very good on, at that to be honest um, and then the careers teacher you know asked me uh, in the sixth form what I wanted to do and I said I you know I, I wanted to work in in radio or in the media and, uh, and and her response was do your parents know about this you know, you, you sure this was a good idea? Um, but I took the notice and, uh, you know, started um, trying to work my way uh, towards doing this by, you know, volunteering for, for hospital radio. So from when I was 14, I was doing a, a programme, which I have to admit wasn't very good, called Claudia's Sunday Requests uh, at the local hospital. The same hospital that had, in fact, saved my life when I was a baby. So it was really nice, you know, to be going back there um, and, and, and started that way, trying to get the experience to get in. That's fantastic. Um, and I gather you then went on to work in the newsroom at BBC Three Counties Radio when you were only 18, which is fabulous. But um, then you sort of suddenly went off in a different direction and chose to study applied psychology at Sussex University and then into health, um, an MSc in health psychology at Surrey. So what were the things that led you in that direction? 
Yeah, so I knew when I was at school that I, I knew I wanted to work in radio, but I knew I wanted to do a new subject. I I, uh, I did very mixed A-levels. I did, I did physics and maths and German and art, and I liked sciences and I liked arts, and I knew I didn't want to do any of those subjects as, as a degree, though. I wanted to do something new and different. Um, and so I had already decided, before I had my year out, um, where I got the job in the local radio station, I'd already decided that psychology would be the subject that would be interesting. And what really appealed to me was that it seemed to be a combination of all the things that I liked doing. You know, there was um, uh, research methods were involved, you know, rigorous methods that there was um, uh, maths involved in the stats, but that it was about people as well. And so it seemed to combine, uh, you know, evidence that I was very interested in how you get the best evidence uh, with humans, which like everybody I'm interested in, um, and human behavior. And so I thought this, well, this sounds like the ideal subject. Um, and then while I was at Sussex University, I worked part time all the way through actually for the, the local radio station there, the BBC station there, Radio Sussex. Um, and uh, but then got really into psychology. And so then I couldn't decide what I should do when I left, but was so interested in psychology that um, and I was very lucky enough to get a, a studentship from a research council at, at that time um, and got a place uh, on, a, on a master's course doing health psychology. And I'd partly got interested in health psychology in particular from that experience when I was uh, working in hospital radio of um, be before I each Sunday evening when I went there, I used to go around the wards talking to the patients, asking them for their uh, requests of what music they would like to hear on the radio that evening. And I'm convinced that not many people listen to it, but they did enjoy chatting. And I got really interested in chatting to those patients. And, and sometimes they would tell me about terrible um, symptoms they'd had of, of things happening to them uh, that they didn't want to tell the doctor about or the nurses because they didn't want to bother them. And they're telling this 14 year old girl instead. And, and this just sort of got me very interested in in how people think about their health and what they do about it and what they don't do about it. And so what, once I did a, a bit of psychology and medicine as part of the um, as part of my undergraduate course and got really interested in that and thought, well, this will be an interesting subject. So then after that, I was torn really because there was radio on the one hand that I'd been working in and really loved, and then there was psychology on the other hand, which I hadn't expected to love quite as much as I did. And so then I wasn't quite sure how I was going to go about doing both of these. So so for for a long while. I kind of kept them going as separate tracks. And so when I first worked after university, after my uh, postgraduate degree, when I first worked, I was freelancing at Radio 5 Live when it had just started. Um, and that was doing general news. So that was doing any news that came up at all. Um, and then I started doing some lecturing in psychology separately. And so they were very separate things for about 10 years while I was reporting. So it was much, life's been much easier since I've managed to combine them all, to be honest. It's, it's much easier specializing because everything's about the same subject now. Everything I do is either about psychology or about health. Yes, I mean, it, it is wonderful though to hear how you sort of really got expertise in both of these streams so that you could really bring them together so well. And I gather in 2003, you wrote and presented a popular Radio 4 series called Emotional Roller Coaster, which explored the science of emotions and what they are and why they happen and how they're created. And then you wrote your first book with the same name in 2005. Um, so that was a new development. And was writing a book something you were already knowing you're going to pursue or did it just sort of come about by chance how did that happen oh i know i'd always thought the idea of writing a book would be uh fantastic and my uh the father's a writer and has, has written lots of non-fiction books and i'd always you know seen the proofs all around the house when i was younger and and had always thought wouldn't it be amazing to write a book um and then i i started around that same time when i was doing the series on emotions thinking well what would it be interesting to write a book about and that series they were just 15 minute programs and so so in fact the book ended up being very very different and isn't a book of the series but there was so much more to say about all of these things and I realized how interested people were in them that then I um, wrote uh, you know looked up how to, how you write a proposal which I, I didn't know how you write a proposal for a non-fiction book wrote a proposal sent it uh, sent it to an agent who um, uh, got in touch straight away saying yes I think this is interesting and you know then helped me to rewrite the proposal because I hadn't done it in the right way at all and a few weeks later Said yes, I've got a I've got a publisher who's interested, and and uh, for the stage part of Papa Collins published that first book, which was amazing. I still remember so well the phone call where where he phoned up and said yes, they want it. And I thought I can't believe I'm allowed to write a book. This is this seems amazing. 
<laughs> oh, that's a lovely story. Um, and another thing you've done, I mean, you've, you've got many strings to your bow because you've used your media background so that you've been able to do this large scale research with the media. Um, so collaborating on these big, big studies with academics and the media on subjects such as loneliness and rest. Um, so can you tell, tell us a bit about well, whose idea was that and how did it come about? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's been that? an amazing opportunity to do that because it means it's brought together, you know, one of the things I, I might have done was to um, to uh, continue in psychology and go on to doing research. And I, I had always thought that was very interesting. And obviously I spend a lot of my time interviewing people about their research. And so to um, to get to be involved in that as well as programs has, has, has been a real luxury. It's been really nice. Um, it first came about, the first one I did was, uh, was called the rest test. Um, and that was with a group of psychologists, mostly from Durham University. And that was because um, I was part of um, uh, a, a residency that I was invited to. Uh, a group of people were applying for a residency at Wellcome Collection in London. And this was the chance to spend uh, two years on the top floor, um, occupying the top floor of the Wellcome Collection on the Euston Road to look at one subject in particular with a whole group of people. And we applied and I... I really never dreamt we would succeed in, in getting it um, and we got it and so rest was the topic and we had um, composers and geographers and all sorts of people from all sorts of dis different disciplines which has been absolutely fascinating because I spend most of my time interviewing uh, doctors and psychologists who are great and I love that so it's absolutely fascinating to talk to completely different um, people doing completely different subjects and to work with artists and so on uh, and to just see how people from different disciplines uh, have been taught and trained to think in a different way and just ask really interesting questions that I'd not have thought of um, about things. And so that was how the first one came about. Um, and then I talked to Radio 4 and the World Service once I was part of this residency about whether we could do um, something much bigger. We were doing lots of small things with audiences. And I was interested to know, well, what do a lot of people think about this? And is there a, uh, a real opportunity? Because the media has the advantage of being able to reach a huge number of people. So the you know World Service has 97 million listeners a across a week uh, listening in English. And uh, uh, Radio 4, say, All in the Mind has uh, 1.2 million listeners. And so there's a chance to reach a load of people um, that you couldn't normally do in research or would be very difficult to do in research. And so um, so it was great. And it was great to see uh, the psychologists who led the study. It was great to see how that was done and then how other subjects could feed into it as well, which they very much did in some of the questions in that. Um, and then I, uh, after rest, I... I uh, thought it would be great to do this again. And I was noticing the topic of loneliness becoming more and more talked mm. about. And I thought to do something large scale on loneliness would be really interesting. And I managed to persuade Welcome to fund that. And then we're just on a third one, which uh, the results uh, were uh, all over Radio 4 for a week last week. Uh, so it sort of got mm. bigger, uh, which was called the um, the touch test, which was all about touch, which, which 40,000 people took part in, which was amazing. So it's been really interesting to see how that works. And obviously there are limitations because people decide to take part. So it's it's different from a study where you may have a, a more a representative sample who haven't chosen to take part. But it's interesting to see what you can and then can't do with that data and how it then, what's interesting with all of these three is how well they then fit in actually with other research that's been done. They sort of link in together and, and form part of a bigger picture. Yes, uh, but I'm impressed that uh, you, you say that, but you, you're actually often tackling subjects that I think haven't been looked at really closely, um, certainly not on this sort of scale with people giving opinions on them. And so it, it's really, it's, it's great to see you doing really quite novel things, I would say. But do you think um, these large scale studies have helped with changing attitudes towards mental health in the media. And that's because you obviously you're focusing particularly yeah. the loneliness one on, on a topic that um, I think for many years, people didn't like to admit loneliness because it was sort of seen, you know, almost a, a, a admission of somehow failing or something. Yes, and it's interesting that in the research, people are more likely to answer, people answer the question differently depending on whether the word loneliness is in there. And previous researchers found that, you know, men in particular are less likely to to admit in a, in a, in even in anonymous confidential research that they feel lonely, but they will say they haven't got the friends they'd like to have, they haven't got the relationships they'd like, that they feel left out sometimes. So people will use different phrases. So I think, yeah, particularly with the loneliness, it was a way of 
talking very openly about a subject and then it has been really interesting how many people then did get in touch and talk about that and we didn't know whether with all of these you you, you put it out there and you go to a lot of effort to try to launch it and make sure it's publicized and make sure people hear about it and you have no idea whether I think these subjects are really interesting but is everyone else going to agree or not uh, you, we wait to see how many people take part um, and with the loneliness actually 55,000 people took part um, and I think that is because it's such a, a crucial a crucial uh, social issue as well and so I hope that you know I would like it if it did change things in terms of getting people to to talk about it more and to talk about it in all sorts of different Different forums and and as well as doing uh, I do I make lots of radio four and world service programs about all the results when they come out but then lots of other places that are very different will interview us about the results um, and so we're able to 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 uh, to engage a different groups of people who we wouldn't necessarily reach because of there being this um, big piece of research that's been done and so uh, so I hope that that's really useful and and with all of these the, the the data then in the end becomes open access and so I would really like it if, if other researchers then took this big big amount of data there is because we ask about so many different things you know people spend 30 to 40 minutes investing their time in filling it in so I'd love it if people researched it for years you know there's many PhDs worth of stuff in there to be extracted that's fantastic so you're really you know creating a resource for other people as well as as answering questions uh, that you started with um and with the survey you did on rest the re um the other big study I, that relates to your latest book i gather so you have your latest yeah. book the art of rest um and what was the most surprising finding from that particular study well, it was it was very interesting actually because so this was the study that was done by the the group from Durham University, and um, what was really interesting was one of the things we looked at which, which hadn't really been done before was what sorts of activities people found restful and in fact I I've done a kind of top ten countdown that the the book is structured around counting from ten down to the most popular and what was really interesting was that the top five were all activities that people tend to do on their own um, and so although people enjoy things like socializing, particularly now as it's getting harder. Um, those things like socializing or eating out with friends, they came at numbers like sort of number 18 and 21 and 23 in terms of the list of activities that people found most restful. But the top five were all things people liked doing on their own. And I think that what this shows is that in order to get a rest, sometimes what we need is a rest from other people which is interesting because in a way that's kind of the opposite of, of, of loneliness there, but that even if you do have the people that you, relationships that you would like, what people sometimes want in order to rest is to get away from those people and to get some time on their own. And whatever the activity was, there were different sorts of activities. Um, uh, uh, reading came at number one, for example. Um, people seem to like them because they're partly because they could do them on their own and get some, get some real peace there. And I think that people, are very very busy and want to try to get some some rest and some peace and i think that even say in, in lockdown when some people were furloughed you could say oh well then they got all the rest they wanted in the world but one thing that that we did find was that enforced rest isn't the same enforced rest doesn't feel as restful so you know people who are in prison get to rest a lot of the time but i don't think they would say it was a lovely restful time that they had when they were there and likewise if if you're not if you're not able to do anything because of the pandemic and the situation and not being able to work then that's not a that's not something that feels restful and in fact in the study we found that People who had uh, a very small amount of rest, their well-being was lower. People who had uh, a big amount of rest, say, uh, you know, 10 hours rest a day, their well-being was also lower. So it's a question of getting the balance between rest and activity rather than just saying more rest is, is what we really need. Mm. And in your book, you encourage people to take rest more seriously, to take it as seriously as, as sleep. Um, and you offer some ideas, a sort of roadmap for uh, having a more restful and balanced life. And this seems really important because I think so many of us almost, you know, we feel it's lazy to take rest or, or it's sort of somehow morally wrong to just be giving, especially if it is these sort of activities you do on your own, that we, we sort of somehow feel we should be rushing around yeah. doing things or achieving or whatever. Um, do you have any tips you can share about, with the audience about how we might, we get better at unwinding and calming our minds and recharging our bodies 
Sure. And you, and you make a very good point there. So 9% of people who responded told us that they felt guilty whenever they rested. And in fact, when we wow. ask people words associated with rest, words, uh, uh, you know, words like calm and relaxing came up, but also um, a, a number of significant number of people um, said things like frustrating and difficult um, and hard to obtain. And so so we do seem to have this tricky relationship with it. So one of the things that I suggest is to um, when you've worked out which activities, and it will be different for different people just because something came at number one, it doesn't mean that that's what everybody should be doing. You need to find the activities or the group of activities that you find restful. And then to, to try really hard to almost prescribe yourself uh, 15 minutes of doing that rest each day if you can. Now, I know if people are really busy, particularly if people are, say, working and caring, and when people were homeschooling their kids, that's a lot easier said than done. But if you can find that 15 minutes, and do the thing you find restful and so as not to feel guilty tell yourself well this is for my mental health and i'm going to do this now so for example i find gardening the most restful thing i have a, a tiny tiny greenhouse that just has room for me to stand in it and now deliberately particularly when i'm working at home i, I may say in the middle of the afternoon decide well i'm going to prescribe myself now 15 minutes of gardening and i'm just going to go and deadhead things um or if it's raining i'll go in the greenhouse and uh it is absolutely lovely and I feel straight away that sort of calm coming over me and if you can if you can find the activity for you that does that then to carve out that 15 minutes I think is really important and then I think if you are if you're so busy that it's very difficult then one thing is that we don't always notice the moments of rest that we can have we don't always notice the uh, opportunities to rest. And I think sometimes time that feels like wasted time, we could reframe it in our minds as restful time. So if you've uh, you missed the parcel and you've got to go and queue at the delivery office uh, yet again for, and for a long time, then uh, that may be you know, really annoying because you're wasting 10 minutes when you've got loads of things to do. But if somebody said to you at a different time, you can have 10 minutes now to just lean against this wall and watch the world go by then you may think that was okay and quite a nice thing and so i think it's important to try to reframe those annoying wasted moments as this is this is restful now and i'm, I'm going to rest in some way and i'm going to do that and I'm, I'm not going to i can't do anything about this time so i'm going to rest instead that sounds sounds very sane <laughs> and um currently of course we we have really massive problems with coronavirus affecting everybody um, and we're hearing about increasing problems with mental health and so on. And these are things you have discussed on your show, All in the Mind, and on the World Service in the evidence. Um, do you have any plans to work on a larger scale project on that topic? Yes, I don't know if we'll do a research project on that. They 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 take so long to sort of get off the ground that well, I'm hoping pandemic will be over by the time we could get it going. But um, it is definitely a subject. We the new series of All in the Mind starts at the beginning of November, and this is definitely a, a subject we're going to uh, return to. And uh, and I think it is such an important topic. And I'm now on. I think with the evidence is a program on the World Service that's that's all about the evidence around COVID nineteen because I have a a kind of sidelining global health programs as well. So um, obviously global health is, is big on everyone's minds at the moment. And so I think I'm on, um, this is the kind of thing I do when I can't get to sleep. I think I'm on the 58th program on I've done on, on COVID-19. So um, we will no doubt uh, continue doing those. And so many COVID-19 programs will be coming up in the future. And and I think that mental health is, a, is an important thing to look at at those. And one thing I really want to do is to look at how we get through this winter, you know, what it is that we can do, what steps people can take in their own lives in order to try to get through, um, you know, the next few months, which I think, you know, may be harder without the, without the long light evenings and the very good weather that yeah. we were blessed with before. So yeah. I think that's going to be a, a challenge. And I think the uncertainty is the hardest thing, the thing we have to somehow try to learn to deal with is that we don't know when it ends, sadly. Mm. Yeah. Um... To, to change to your current situation, I was fascinated to hear that you are visiting professor of the public understanding of psychology at the University of Sussex. You must be the only one of those in the world. Is that right? Um, I think there's a I think uh, I think Richard Wiseman at the University of Hertfordshire is professor of the public understanding of psychology, I think. Okay, right. um, so you're, you're and, animal, uh, 
so yeah, yeah so it's so yeah so yes rare so um yeah and i was i was really pleased i mean i was delighted to be invited to do that because uh well because i you know i was at sussex so there's nothing lovelier than being invited back to your yeah. old university um and uh uh I, I was just starting in fact my very first day of doing all sorts of interesting things in person was going to be march the 23rd so obviously oh. lockdown had begun oh. so so far it's all been i have been back there to talk to, to, to have conversations about about how the role was going to go obviously so far it's all been it's all been remote um uh since then but one day i will be going back there again and that will be really nice and i think that um i really in all the different things i do what i want to do is to try to increase the uh the engagement with psychology and understanding of psychology because i think that there is so much research out there that's really valuable and that really talks to the questions of our time and things that policymakers are trying to decide and things that we're we're all having opinions on and trying to decide and i'm i'm i think that the psychological approach doesn't always get included in that and i think there's really good evidence out there that could be could be used more and so that's one of the things i'm going to work work with people on there at sussex and to talk as well to to the students uh, and uh, and particularly the postgraduate students about how they can use their own work to increase uh, public engagement with psychology as well and how to how to get that out there so that people are talking about it so that it really means something in the real world Yes, I, I mean, it, it, it really, I think, has emerged as incredibly important that we get decent standards of evidence in the area of psychology out there, um, because it's just such a you know, difficult sometimes to find the signal amongst the noise. And that's one of the things that's, that's great about your shows is that one feels, you, you know, it's high quality work that you're presenting. We're nearly out of time. We've just got a couple of minutes and I just wanted to finish before we go to audience questions about what else is on the horizon for you. So uh, lots more COVID programs, um, then the new series of, of All in the Mind that's coming up. Um, and I have started another book. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about the topic of that book yet, um, uh, but that will come out soon. And then the uh, the paperback of The Art of Rest comes out in a couple of weeks time and comes out in America next week. So I shall be uh, talking some more about uh, rest at all sorts of different um, events. And, and it's always fascinating doing those because people's questions about rest are so interesting and um uh when i'm doing you know programs in a studio unless it happens to be a phone in then you know i don't get people's questions till afterwards and so it's uh i love live events even uh, you know on online because it is so interesting to see how people think differently about things and the connections that people make that i had never thought of i love that because I mean, it's i'm kind of always learning in a way i feel that i'm in a very privileged position because what I do is a bit like being a perpetual student. I get to endlessly read new uh, new papers in scientific journals, in psychology journals. Um, and then, unlike when I was a student, I then get to interview the people who wrote them and ask all the things that I wasn't sure about and say, but hold on, how does this work and what would that mean and, and so on. So it's I get to be curious forever and, and learn more things forever, which I, which I really like. That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much for uh, a fascinating conversation. Um, and we are going to now go on to audience questions. If anybody in the audience mm -hmm. wants to ask a question, they can type it into the chat. I see a question has already popped up here. Um, so there's a question that says your comments about rest, they chime with experience of people who are working at the HERA project for primary care patients in Brighton. And the question is, do you have a view on the role of creativity in well-being? That's a, that's a very good question. So um, uh, creativity and uh, arts and crafts um, came at number, it was either number 12 or number 13 um, as the activity that people found um, most restful. So very high, so higher than uh, socialising, higher than doing things with pets, higher than gardening, in fact. So um, I think that definitely it can be because I think that uh, if it's something you enjoy and, and that you find you can become absorbed in, that this is a key thing. So that one of the things I've tried to do is to identify what the essence of rest is by looking at each of these topics in more these, these activities in more detail. And one of the things it seems to need to do is to distract us from our worries, to distract us from those thoughts going round and round in your head all the time. And I think that. Uh, doing you know creative arts can be perfect for that because it's something you can become so absorbed in and there's this uh, concept that was identified by the psychologist Mahali Csikszentmihalyi 
uh, a couple of decades ago now um, called flow and the, the thing that gives you flow and again it won't be the same for everybody a flow is when you become completely absorbed in what you're doing and you don't notice it's not as if time's going fast or slowly you don't really notice time um, because you are just concentrating on that and that can be so restful even though you're concentrating and one of the things we found was that the activities that were restful could be hard work, if you like. Some people put down, you know, 8% of people put down running as the thing that they found most restful and found they couldn't really uh, rest their mind until they tired out their bodies. Um, and so it doesn't, uh, something where that does require a lot of concentration, um, like reading or like doing creative arts, I think can be really restful and, and hugely important. Thank you. Um... Another question also about rest is, uh, in your survey internationally, did you discover particular countries or communities who are better at resting than others? Or perhaps we should expand it and say, are there some that are particularly bad at resting? We found that the overall amount of rest that people got each day, um, which was about three hours a day. Now, I know three hours that lots of people might be thinking three hours I should be so lucky that sounds like a lot it depends people were able to define what they counted as resting so if you find cooking enjoyable and restful then that time would count as might uh, sitting on a train on the way to work count um, and so so that which is how you can get up to the three hours if you like so we found that the average was three hours worldwide um, and that when we looked at different countries um, they may have slightly more, but sort of 10 minutes more or slightly less. So we didn't see that much variation. We did see um, variation in things like uh, one interesting question was, do you see um, is work the opposite of rest? And in the UK and uh, the US, and France and Germany, um, uh, the majority of people, usually about three quarters ish, would say that they did think that uh, work was the opposite of rest. In India, only 54% of people said that they thought that work was the opposite of rest, which I thought was interesting. And there were also some differences when it came to the uh, activities. So the top 10 was roughly the same in most countries. Um, in um, uh, the UK, being in nature came second. Uh, that came first uh, in New Zealand. Um, and um, being on your own came higher in Germany than in, in other countries, although it was pretty high. It was at a number four here in the UK and worldwide. So there were very slight differences in the activities. But more, what was interesting was that, that we didn't see that many um, differences. Um, and actually, even we also looked at personality and even the uh, if you just took the people who scored high on extroversion even the extroverts didn't include socializing with other people in the top 10 activities which was really interesting i thought fascinating yes i mean that that is so interesting i suppose it's it, the, for rest you might you perhaps need to be in a situation where you have no sense of anybody making social demands on you even if they're people you like but that you can just do exactly what you want to do with out being yeah you know, having to accommodate to anybody else's needs i think that's yeah. exactly what it is and so i think that's why so uh, being watching tv for example wasn't number nine and lots of people we know from other research watch tv alongside somebody else um, and 25 percent of the time when people are watching tv they're talking through it um but there's no requirement to talk you know you sit side by side you can talk if you want to and i think one of the reasons people say they find it relaxing is that nothing is required of you from the other person you're allowed to just sit there whereas yeah even if mm -hmm. you're out with friends you need to consider are they okay uh am i uh, uh talking too much what am i doing should i be doing this are they all right what do they think um and people worry about what other people think of them and all of those things uh, all come into it as well. It would have been very different if we'd asked people what do you in activities do you enjoy most, then I think friends would have come into it. And I think that is really borne out by yeah. what people say they miss at the moment is seeing, you know, is seeing friends and family as much as they would like to. So it's really hugely important. It's just not necessarily restful. We've got an awful lot of questions here about rest. Oh. I'm sorry to people if I don't get through all of them. But um, somebody's also asked, is rest equally important to our health in retirement? Because the sense in retirement is that you're, it's emphasized how you've got to stay active. So is it, you know, could you just, and I, and I know as well that there is research on aging that suggests one of the worst things you can do is just sort of give up and sit in a chair and you, you know, the idea that you should be somehow use it or lose it. Um, so yeah, is, is that I, a yes. problem? That, 
Yeah. So I think, again, it's this it's this thing of the balance between activity and rest um, and getting the rhythms of those right for you. And so I think, yes, to rest all the time in retirement might not be a brilliant idea and might not make you that happy um, that you might need to have a, um, you know, a combination of that with activity. I mean, some people, of course, will say in retirement that they are busier than they've ever been um, and that they don't get, you know, that they don't get a moment because there's suddenly all of these things that they want to do. Um, and so I think there are some people who in retirement almost won't allow themselves to rest because they think they, again, they think they should be so busy all the time. And I think we need to get this balance between rest and busyness. We don't have to be busy all the time. It's okay not to be. Yes. Um, then somebody also raised the issue about what if you're somebody who feels the only way to rest your mind is to engage in intensive physical activity? Because you've already mentioned there are some people who said that <laughs> going for a run was their way of resting. But so there's this sort of distinction, I suppose, here between the resting of the body and resting of the mind, which sounds like they can get quite dissociated. Yes, I think that's absolutely true. And I think so. I think they pinpointed something really important there. And so it's absolutely fine if uh, physical activity is your way of resting your mind. I think what is important is to find the way that there is of resting your mind. And of course, to to, um, you know, allow your body to rest and recover if you've been if you've been, you know, doing an enormous amount of exercise, which is, you know, why people pull off and you know trainers often recommend doing exercise every other day so that your muscles can can recuperate in between but i think there's nothing wrong with that being your main way of resting your mind and i think that and, and of course it's the exercise is good for you anyway physically and i think a, a huge number of people will uh, relate to that and think yes this is this is their restful thing and in fact i'd also wonder whether it might for those who, who find it more difficult to to get themselves to go round to get round to running, particularly say if that's what they didn't like doing, particularly if that as the evenings get dark, to sort of think, oh well, this is good for me, not just good for me for my body. This is good for me mentally. This is good for me rest wise. This is my rest now and my time. And 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 there are some people who, if they're not allowed, to, can't for some reason do the activity that they want to, the physical activity, find that very difficult, and then find themselves feeling restless. So, uh, mm. so yes, I think it's a good idea to rest in that way if you like it. Yes. Um, now, a really challenging question, moving more generally, not just to rest, but to some of the issues you raised about mental health. Um, there's a question that there's a lot of conversation around mental health. So we're now at least talking about it, but there's still an awful lot of people suffering. Do you have any thoughts on how all this discussion and awareness can be turned into real change? Yes, I think that's such a good question and such an important question. And I think, you know, it's taken it's taken a long time for the awareness to, to, to happen and to get through. And there are still, of course, situations where people absolutely do not feel that they can share their mental health status with their boss, say. Um, and hopefully those are becoming fewer and, and hopefully it is getting easier for people to talk about. But I absolutely agree that um, more needs to be done than just say, oh, well, it's all right because we all talk about it now. Um, there does need to be real change. There do need to be uh, uh, you know, it, it does need to be ensured that there are services available to everybody quickly when they need them. And uh, it is there is, you know, ample evidence around that that is often not the case. Um, I also think that it's uh, where we don't seem to have got a lot further is uh, with research on on causes and on the interventions that really really work um, and so I think it's it's really there's a really interesting new approach being taken um, by uh, the Wellcome Trust actually at the moment which which I think is fascinating where they are um, uh, setting aside a load of money for funding for mental health research but it is only for research on interventions and to see what works and what doesn't work and it doesn't have to be um, therapy or something like that. It can be anything. It can be um, a, a trial to see whether starting schools later for teenagers uh, helps them to get more sleep, um, which then uh, helps their mental health in the long run. It can be the things that seem to be a bit divorced from it, but practical things which might make a difference. And they are are then going to you know fund people to do these things. And uh, rather than looking at basic causes, if you like. Now, I think it's really important to look at basic causes, too, and we really need to do that. Um, but sometimes it's hard to see the progress in that. Sometimes it's hard to see, well, do we do how much do we really understand any better than we did uh, exactly what is causing something and exactly what's causing it for an individual? And so I think that in order to alleviate suffering, intervention is is 
uh, finding the best interventions that really, really work is absolutely key. Thank you. Um, changing tack a bit now to um, somebody interested in perhaps a career more like yours. So we've got a question from somebody who says they're an early career researcher in psychology. What advice would you have for people like me who want to bring research to a wider audience? I don't know that this person wants to do your career <laughs> or whether it's more that they just want to get into better engagement with, with public audiences yeah. about research they're doing. Yeah, so I'd really encourage anyone doing research to 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 make sure they they can engage with audiences. And so I think then the the uh, what say different um, programs or magazines or anything will always be looking for is a reason to do something. We call it a peg, a reason to do something at that moment. What is new about it? Uh, which might be that your new piece of research has just come out. Um, in which case, um, your uh, press office from your university uh, should have good contacts for knowing how that how they can get that research out there. Um, and it's a it's a really good idea to contact them proactively to say that there's something that you would like to talk about or to think, is there is there something uh, where you are, um, where you can offer, say, uh, to uh, talk on your local radio station when they'd like somebody to talk about psychology more generally? Um, could you, you know, offer your deliberately, proactively offer yourself as a as a guest there or to get involved in any opportunities you can find to, you know, to write blogs, to um, engage on social media about um, uh, psychological research, to, um, to to get it out there in any any way you can, to look for where the gaps are, where you might be able to do that, I think is is really important. And then if you're going to do it, to then think about it from um, the point of view of the audience for whatever audience that would be, whether it's audiences reading a, reading a blog or listening to the radio or watching TV, to think about who those would be and what the best way would be of communicating it um, in, in a way that would engage people that they would find interesting and, um, and uh, you know, understandable. Um, and the most popular pieces are often the things that have some connection with people's real lives you know rather than something that is more theoretical to try to engage people with something very practical but to then show why really good evidence matters and why really good research matters i mean one thing i've done over the years is to to uh, been in, interviewed many times as well as interviewing other people is to decide if I'm being interviewed about a, a, a general -ish subject within psychology that however short it is I will always mention one piece of research so I don't mention you know I can't mention all the authors and so on but I do say well some researchers found this because I think it's really important to to back that up with research rather than this just to be well this is what I think because what I think doesn't matter what matters is what evidence and research shows I think. Yes, I, th I think uh, one of the problems for many of us is that our scientific training is almost at odds with um, being a good person in the media because we always say everything with a thousand qualifications and we have to cite all the references and then we never like to really commit to a view. Um, and I think perhaps the best advice I had from somebody once is if you're going to be interviewed, you know, you, you should often the person interviewing you is typically not hostile. They want you to say something interesting, but you should think what you want to say and get, you know, maybe just one point that you want to get across. Yeah. It's a very short interview um, rather than feeling that you have to, you know, give a full disquisition on the whole topic. And that, but I think that, that perhaps we don't get trained to do that. And there, there's, so I'm, I'm excited by your role, um, you know, in, in, in a university where you might be able to sort of get more people engaged yeah. with how you communicate, not just what you communicate. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And this is one of the things I've already started doing at Sussex is, is to talk to talk to people in in very small groups. We're kind of doing masterclasses where people work out how to talk about their research and how to, as you say, not to expect too much, not to expect that they can say everything on this subject, but to think what are the what are the two or three things they would really like to, to say about this um, and and to try not, if possible, to give too many caveats, because I think that one of the ways in which sometimes psychological research can get neglected and ignored by policymakers as if is if people always say well we don't know yet because more research is needed because decisions are being made right now about lots of yeah. things and particularly right now about all sorts of things and those decisions will be made whether we wait for the research or not so if if psychologists have an opinion and and even if the best evidence so far tells us this they need to feel that they can say that because 10 years time is too late yes Yes, well, thank you. Um, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our allocated slot. Um, 
thank you so much for uh, the questions that we've had, and I apologise to those whose questions we couldn't get around. There's clearly a huge amount of interest in this topic. Um, and thank you particularly to Claudia for a really wonderful Now, I'm afraid my screen of you, Dorothy, has frozen, so I don't know if I'm talking over you here. Um, but uh, sorry if I am, any apologies, but it seems to have um, stopped at the moment. But I just want to say thank you ever so much for all those questions from everybody, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been uh, really interesting, and I'm, I'm very you know, honoured that the British Academy invited me to do this. It's, it's been really interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm.